Hello, I'm Claire Wong Black, and I'm on the advisory committee of the Ninth Circuit Historical Society. I'm here today, September 16, 2022, at the Courthouse for the District of Hawaii to speak with Judge Susan Oki Malwe, Judge Leslie Kobayashi, and Judge Jill Otake about Judge Malwe's recent book, The First Fifteen, How Asian American Women Became Federal Judges, as these three women are three of the first 15. In 1998, Judge Malwe became the first Asian woman in the entire United States to join the ranks of federal judges with lifetime appointments. It took 10 years for the second Asian woman to be appointed. Since then, however, over a dozen more Asian women have received lifetime federal judicial appointments. I think we should first acknowledge that there was a federal magistrate judge who preceded Judge Malwe, and that was Magistrate Judge Marilyn Goh of the Eastern District of New York, but we will talk about her more later. Judge Malwe, on the genesis of the book, this book grew out of your thesis work as part of the Master of Law studies you undertook at Duke University. What was the impetus to make this topic your thesis? So the program um, has some classroom activities on campus, but much of the program is when you're back at home doing your regular job as a judge and you have to make time um, in the course of that to do your thesis. So I knew that I had to do a thesis on a subject that I would stay interested in and work on when I was tired from doing my regular job and um, I had to sustain my interest in it for months and months. So this was a topic that included me and my colleagues and other people that I knew and I thought this was a topic I'd stay interested in and would finish writing about. You reached out to the other 14 women who make up the first 15 and it seems they all agreed to participate in your book. Were they all on board from the beginning or did you have to convince them? For many of them I had to convince them and not um, always was that the case with people I didn't know. Some of the people I thought would be really immediately enthusiastic were very suspicious. So judges are really careful about publicity. And so people were concerned. One of them said no at first. I had to convince her after I had convinced everybody else that she was going to be the only holdout, so she gave in. Um, and I think um, if that was my experience, and I'm in the group, and most of them knew me, I can imagine that if it had not been someone in the group, um, I I'm not sure that all 15 would have agreed to be interviewed. Judges Kobayashi and Otake, what did you think when Judge Malwe reached out to you, and what convinced you to participate? Well, at first, as always, I was really impressed that Susan was going to write a thesis um, on top of everything else that she does. Um, but second, m honestly, my response was, you know, why would anybody be interested in reading anything about me? Um, to this day, I'm stunned that people, you know, come up to us and they're excited about the book. I understand the book. I understand about being excited about Susan being the first Asian American woman ever to be appointed as an Article Three judge. Um, but it's really been surprising that people ask us to, you know, sign our chapter um, and are really excited about it and all kinds of people. Um, it's not just sort of our peers when we see them, but um, particularly touching our young lawyers, young female lawyers and law students. Judge Otake? I think I was mostly in shock that I was number 14. I, I thought I would have been number 30 or something <laughs> like that by now. And so mm -hmm. when she asked me, I was more surprised that we hadn't had more people, um, especially because I took her seat. Um, I was really surprised that we hadn't had more people since she uh, became an Article III judge. But it, it was a great honor. I, I felt kind of a lot like what Judge Kobayashi's describing of, well, nobody's going to want to hear my story. Uh, my story's kind of boring um, and what I discovered was that uh, it was a useful way for me to reflect on my own career so for personal reasons it was helpful because it caused you to sit and think a little bit about your own path which a lot of us don't sit and think about very often. 
each of the stories were really impactful. Um, judge Malway, did you discover some sort of theme or through line from the stories of the first 15 judges you interviewed, or were they all different? Well, everybody's story was different, but there were definitely threads that became easy to follow. So one of them was that so many of the women said that they sought judgeships because they were encouraged by other people to think about themselves as candidates. And it struck me that, you know, it was a sad commentary that women were not thinking of themselves on their own for these positions. I've always imagined that men hear about openings and immediately assume that they should go and seek those openings for themselves. But the reality for women was that most of them uh, didn't imagine themselves as judges. And instead, when they heard that other people perceived them as viable candidates and capable, they, they were a little taken aback and they had to get used to the idea. And um, that was a very interesting discovery I made. I also learned that for many of them, once they decided to seek a judgeship, um, it was no holes barred. They, uh, obviously, they were acting within uh, legal and ethical constraints, but they were um, tireless in their efforts to achieve that goal. And so for some of them, the effort spanned many, many years, and um, th they didn't lose hope. They kept at it. And some of them had to be nominated by uh, even different presidents um, to get confirmed. And that was an extremely interesting um, thing for me to see, that perseverance was kind of a common trait. Judges Kobayashi and Otake, what did you learn from the book? Oh boy, I mean, we, we have fascinating colleagues, you know, and that's another reason why um, when Susan talked about, you know, including my story with it, I was thinking, you know, some of our colleagues literally, you know, had to flee from a war-torn country as a child and overcome personal danger to themselves before they even got to this country. Um, you know, others, you know, had all sorts of experiences as um, true minorities um, that growing up in Hawaii was a very different experience for me. Um, so I found everybody else's stories, quite frankly, to be really fascinating and, um, and something really to be proud of to be part of that group. I, I think the diversity of stories was what struck me and all of us know that the AAPI community is not a monolith. Everybody understands that. But to see it in writing of people you know, I think really struck me. And I think because it's such a humble group where we don't want to talk about ourselves very often, it was really fascinating to me to learn these surprising facts about my colleagues, about their amazing successes and their amazing life stories, and to have not had any clue that these were some of the backgrounds that they came from, I think speaks volumes about their humility as well. The 15 stories, the lived experiences of the judges, really did vary. Judge Malway, does having judges of different backgrounds matter, and why? Well, I think it does, and I think it does because you want the bench to reflect the community. And over and over, young lawyers have said, um, you know, when I look on the bench and I see somebody who looks like me, it makes me think, well, maybe someday I'll be a judge. And even the, the 15 judges that I interviewed commented um, in that way. Now, they didn't have a whole lot of Asian women federal judges to look to, but to see an Asian male judge, for example, um, th that was something that opened their eyes to possibilities in some cases. So I, I do think that um, in terms of encouraging younger lawyers and also in terms of the credibility that the court has, if the court reflects the community, the court's decisions are highly likely to be more respected than otherwise. 
Judge Kobayashi, in the book, Judge Malway refers to your Senate Judiciary Committee hearing as a, quote, marvel of diversity, unquote. Why does she call it that, and can you tell us what that felt like? It was funny because um, there were um, four of us at, at our hearing, preceded by a hearing um, for a district judge who was being considered for um, a, a Ninth Circuit uh, position, um, and Mary Mergia who um, is uh, a Latina, and then there was the four of us. Um, we were two women, two men, um, two Asians, two African Americans, and so we laughed. We called ourselves the Rainbow Coalition because we couldn't believe how diverse everybody was in the room, just watching Judge Mergia's hearing right before ours and then the four of us. Um, but it also, I think, was a sense of pride um, that the administration had looked into each of our communities and had chosen people who had had um, very different uh, type of experiences from one another. Um, and so uh, Judge Carlton Reeves um, was a, a defense attorney. He uh, practiced in federal court. He did all these different things. My other two colleagues who were on the hearing had been former assistant U.S. attorneys. Uh, so we all had different backgrounds. I was the only one, I think, who had been a judge. Um, I was a magistrate judge at the time. So I was just really proud that not only were we uh, coming from different parts of the country and we had diverse you know, ethnic backgrounds, but we had diverse work backgrounds, and that the administration really seemed to be looking for people who brought all sorts of different perspectives. Um, so it was a marvel of diversity, as Judge Maui has mentioned. That's so fantastic. Um, judge Otake, you're the first Asian woman Article Three judge to fill a seat vacated by another Asian woman Article Three judge, Judge Mole. Uh, what import, if any, do you think there is to this? I think anybody who's the first, and I haven't been the first, but anybody who's the first is proud to be the first, but really doesn't want to be the last. <laughs> um, and so I think it's a sign that Judge Malway was blazing the start of a trail, a long trail, but an important one. And I think it's a sign that we are making progress. The fact that Judge Malway was not a one-off, although I think there's, there were people who might have been worried about that, given that it took 10 years um, for the next AAPI woman to be, become an Article III judge. But the fact that she was not a one-off is definitely a sign of hope and progress and a trend that I certain will continue. And an amazing moment was when I was sworn in as a federal district judge. The chief judge of the District of Hawaii administered the oath, and that was Judge Mawe. So uh, a Japanese American, Asian American, Article Three judge administered the oath to me, and that was really a, a, a very powerful moment for me. It's a chicken skin can, moment. Can I tell a little anecdote? So I got an email one day from an Asian male Article III judge in Chicago. This was Edmund Chang, <clears throat> and he was bragging. He said, I just swore in my colleague John Lee, um, who's actually now on the Seventh Circuit, but at that time was being sworn into the district court, Northern District of Illinois. And Judge Chang said, I think this is a first an Asian Article III judge swearing in another Asian Article III judge. And this caused me to immediately reply and to say, you know, you people in Chicago, you think those of us in Hawaii are in some backwater jurisdiction, but we beat you. I have already sworn in Leslie Kobayashi. <laughs> With respect to increased diversity on the bench, Judge Mulway, what role do you think sitting judges can play in encouraging others to apply for judgeships? I think it's hard for someone who's um, not a federal judge to be encouraged by a sitting federal judge to apply and to ignore that. Um, so I do think that we can lend our voices to getting more people interested in applying. We can recognize competent, capable people who would make good judges. Um, and, and I think we'll make the bench better if we do that. Judge Kobayashi, in the book, you're number six in 2010, but you were first in your own right as the first and so far only female magistrate judge 
in the District of Hawaii when you were appointed in 1999. You also have been the first magistrate judge to become an Article III judge in this district. What do you think were the factors that led to these milestones? You know, I think um, luck really plays a huge part of it, but as my son's um, poster in his room says, apparently Kobe Bryant said, you know, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. So that's what I try to convey to other women when I encourage them to at least put their names in or to consider, is that, you know, you have to be prepared because each opportunity that comes up, you don't know when that's going to be. So I had a fortunate opportunity uh, to become a, a magistrate judge, which was a great job. And then Judge Malway came to see me when a position became open when Judge Gilmore uh, was going to take senior status. Um, and Judge Malway, as we all know, is extremely persuasive. Um, but she basically told me it's not I should apply, is that I will apply. Uh, and with that directive, you know, I put in my application. But again, I think it's that preparation that meets opportunity. Um, and, uh, you know, ultimately I was very lucky in getting both. Um, but I think my whole career sort of prepared me for each of these steps, uh, particularly um, having civil cases against Judge Malway when she was in uh, private practice, <laughs> getting honed by uh, competent and very vigorous opposing counsel. But, uh, you know, these opportunities come up and you don't know when they're going to come up. And we really have to encourage, especially young women, to put themselves out there for these opportunities. Judge Otake, like many others in the book, you reference mentors and advisors who encouraged you to apply and assisted you in the application process. How important was this and how might one find these relationships? Well, just as Judge Malway encouraged Judge Kobayashi to apply. Judge Kobayashi encouraged me to apply and helped me through the process. And what's really nice, and I think you see it in the book, is that you'll see a theme of a lot of the women in the book helping each other um, through the process. Karen Grenscholler, who's number 13, uh, sits in Dallas. Um, she helped me a great deal. And I think it's vital because the process is scary. Um, it's not something like anything anybody's ever experienced before in their own individual lives and so having those mentors first of all push you I think is important and secondly having them walk you through the process is important. I think most of the people who have been through the process would say that they feel like they lost the ability to concentrate on anything else for that period of time however long it is and just to have somebody there who can remind you that you know you do have a personal life focus on your personal life take the time to enjoy the moment of the challenge of going through this process, enjoy the fact and have gratitude for the fact that you're in this process and just having those reminders from people who have been through it before and made it onto the bench really helped reassure me and I think steady me during that time. Judge Kobayashi, some of the other judges who came up for appointment at the same time as you encountered some headwinds because of their past work as attorneys. Do you have any advice on that in your career if you want to be a judge? Should you try to avoid controversy ahead of time or just try to overcome it when it, when it comes up? I really believe that in your career, if you choose to be a lawyer, that you have to have courage. Um, and the courage is to speak up to a senior partner or the courage is to speak up when you see injustice or what have you. So if someone is interested in being a federal judge or any kind of judge, to avoid controversy because you want that position um, is not something I would ever recommend. Because as a judge, you're going to have to make decisions that will be unpopular and so forth. So if you're afraid of any kind of controversy, you know, and you try to avoid that during your career, I don't know how ultimately that prepares you well to be a judge. Now, that being said, there are people who have had a very hard time um, during their hearings um, who have not been confirmed as a result and then have subsequently run for Senate and now opposes a lot of judges who are being uh, nominated. But that aside, um, you know, when I was going through my hearing, Carlton Reeves was the most controversial of the four of us. Um, and he spoke his truth in terms of 
uh, position that he took when he was the president of the Magnolia Bar Association in opposing a nomination of a federal judge for a circuit position um, on grounds about the importance of diversity uh, on the circuit bench. Uh, and he was ultimately confirmed, but his confirmation took a lot longer than Judge Edmund Chang and myself. Um, and I have to say, I think he's been a remarkable judge, um, you know, in Mississippi, and is now going to just been appointed by the president to the Sentencing Commission. So I think because he is a person who has uh, expressed great courage and great determination of, of speaking, you know, to injustice in the face of criticism or questioning. And that's the kind of people we need, you know, as judges. So I would advise people, don't, advi don't avoid controversy just for the sake of being nominated someday. Judge Malway, you've been very careful in writing this book not to assume that people know how the judicial system and especially the judicial appointment system works. Who were you hoping would read this book and what impact do you hope it will have? So, you know, when I first was writing my thesis, um, I, I tried to figure out who is my audience for this book. And basically, when you're writing a thesis, it's the thesis committee and your advisor. So, um, uh, the thesis had a much more academic sound to it. But when it was accepted for publication by Rutgers University Press, the publisher decided, we want to market this to a general audience. And so I had to revamp things, and I was helped in that regard by having an editor who was not a lawyer and who asked me many questions about things that I had glossed over knowing that a legal audience would know the background. And so that forced me to um, pay attention to things that the general public might not be so readily aware of. Um, I don't know that the general public is going to be therefore interested in reading this book, but I hope that if a member who is not a lawyer reads it, that it is understandable. Judge Kobayashi and Judge Otake, have you participated in talks about the book to groups of non-lawyers, and if so, how do the audience questions differ? I don't know if we've participated in a group before non-lawyers. Maybe I, a group that has some law students, but not, but not any non-lawyers yet. Yeah. And but, were the questions different from the, the students as opposed to the lawyer groups? I think there was just a general interest in um, the process and um, what experience sort of led me to be a judge and what it is to be a judge. I have to say, um, I have a group of girlfriends who have, you know, taken, Judge Mawi was nice enough to give me a copy of the book, and I guess they're too cheap to order their own copy. <laughs> um, but they all sort of circulated it and actually sat with their daughters um, and some sons and, you know, read the book or the sections about the judges that are here in Hawaii. And it's really interesting what their daughters, some of them are college age, some of them are high school, and they were first just done. They had, I mean, they knew I was a judge, but I don't think they know what we do or what process we have to go through. And so it was eye-opening in that respect, you know, how you have to go through a hearing and uh, that the judges like this sit all over the country in different places. So I think it was really um, educational for them to find out what a federal judge is, because I think the average person on the street certainly doesn't know that. Um, we try to have schools come in, um, and they're really interested. Um, so the person or the type of work they think judges do, you know, comes from television, mostly Judge Judy. Um, so they think that's what we do all day, um, or from Law and Order, right? So it was very um, eye-opening, I think, for these young women to read Susan's book and hear about the process and what we do. Judges, do you have any last thoughts you'd like to share about the book, starting with Judge Mulway? Well, I think, you know, I, I often got asked after I became a judge whether I regretted um, some of my activities that ended up creating uh, delays in my confirmation. And I always have answered, no, I do the same thing in a heartbeat because what I was doing 
was working on things that were of interest to me. So along the lines of what Leslie Kobayashi has just said, I think it is impossible to try to gear your life around being so non-controversial that you couldn't possibly offend any decision maker if ever you came up uh, to be voted on. Um, you don't know what the political situation will be, um, public perceptions change, issues that were hot button issues uh, 10 or 20 years ago no longer are. And so if you try to make your life so non-controversial, I think one, it, it will not succeed um, in getting you a judgeship, but two, uh, you will lose out on so many opportunities. And um, I, I really encourage people to do what is of interest to them. Judge Kobayashi. Well, I'm looking forward to Susan's next book on the, <laughs> the next 15. It is not my book. <laughs> so there are, as of today, 27 women who have been confirmed to Article Three judges. So someone can write the second 15. I'm a lot older than my colleagues. They have more energy. I think one of them should write that book. <laughs> Judge Otake. I, I just want to, I do want to thank Judge Malway for writing it because I think it's an important part of our history, not just as AAPI women, but just in general, part of our U.S. history. And I also want to thank our friends and sisters who participated mm -hmm. because there is a degree of vulnerability that goes yes. into sitting for these interviews and telling your stories. Um, like Judge Kobayashi, I was very nervous that mine would be boring, and I, I think mine is <laughs> compared to quite a few of ours. Uh, Judge Kobayashi and I joke that we're the two whose dads were dentists. <laughs> and we, ours, so our history is not as fascinating. But I do want to commend and thank with a deep sense of gratitude Judge Malway for even thinking of doing this, and then all of our friends who decided to agree to this project and understood the importance of it. And I think it gives not only a sense of who we are as individuals, but who we are as a community. And I would just add to that is the thing that really it celebrates for me is how many times that I can think of the first 15, but definitely the three of us, have been the only woman in the deposition, have been the only woman on the trial team, was the only woman representing a party uh, in a room full of men and nothing against men I have two sons and I hope they grow up and, and do what they want to do but it matters it really matters and so to think that today there are 27 female Asian American uh, article 3 judges uh, is just so gratifying that the representation is out there because our point of view our experiences our ability to make decisions that affect everyday lives of citizens and non-citizens in this country matters. And um, I'm so proud of Susan for writing this book and showing in a very graphic way, these are 15 women from different parts of the country who grew up differently and have this opportunity um, and have been vetted by Congress, have been nominated by the president, and we get to do these terrific jobs and make really impact in our communities. Um, even two daughters of dentists, you know. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's it's really, it's a great club, so to speak, to be a part of. And, you know, I'm so grateful every day to be part of that club. I'm really grateful to have colleagues because when I was um, the only one, I got both blame and credit for what other Asian mm -hmm. women did. Mm -hmm. And one time I got credit for what <laughs> Leslie Kobayashi had done. I was in New York City, and a former extern of mine told me that her law school professor thought I was brilliant. Now, that was a really nice thing for me to hear, but I was really puzzled because I didn't recall ever meeting a law professor from her school. So when I came back, I asked Leslie if she had met somebody from that school, and she said she had. So I told her, well, the good news is that professor thinks you're brilliant,
But the bad news is, he thinks your name is Susan Malway. <laughs> so I'm sorry, but I'm getting credit for whatever brilliance you uttered to him. And so I'm happy that that is probably less likely to occur, that I am less likely to be both blamed and credited with my colleagues' um, uh, experiences, because really, we have more of us now, and I'm so happy. None of the stories were boring. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing with us today, and thank you, Judge Mulway, for writing this book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.